Manish is the executive vice president of the World Resources Institute, a global research organization that focuses on sustainability issues. I meet Manish in DC at the organization's global headquarters. So Manish, uh, tell me your story. I mean, how did you get into environmental work? It's, it's quite interesting. It started um, very early in my life when I was a child. And I was actually born and I raised outside of Chicago in a fairly affluent neighborhood. But I'm from India originally. My parents were immigrants that came back, uh, came here to the States in the 60s. And so after I was born, we used to spend virtually every summer in India. So spending part of the year here and outside of Chicago, living a very conventional middle class life, and then spending time in India in a Rajasthan, which is a particularly dry desert state, particularly poor, that juxtaposition really brought kind of issues of poverty, deprivation, quality of life front and center. And I think it really gave me a much, much deeper appreciation for working on poverty, dealing with hunger. And what was interesting was how quickly my time there, I began to understand the links between poverty and the environment and sustainability. Rajasthan um, is the state with kind of very arid, but I, my father is from a city that is on a lake kind of on the outskirts of this desert. And over time, I saw the trees getting cut uh, around the city, the water being polluted, and the impacts that had on people. And it became something that I just became very sensitized to at an early age. And so that, that really was a pretty powerful set of moments of both getting committed to poverty, but really understanding the links between poverty and the environment. Manish oversees WRI's programs worldwide and opened offices in China, India, and Brazil. Much of the climate debate will play out not just in the US and Europe, but in China and in India and in Brazil, some of these large growing economies and I think the big question is, can they find ways to continue, quite importantly, their growth, but to do so in ways that are both inclusive and low carbon? Just think about the middle class that's emerging around the world. Uh, in 1990, one billion people lived in the middle class. In 2015, it was three billion. In 2030, it's gonna be five billion people in the middle class. And the choices they make as, as terms of, uh, as consumers, the types of uh, sh stocks or bonds they own, who they vote for, the decisions that they make will have a massive implication on the future fate of this planet. In terms of the environment, there, there continues to be a view amongst some that you either have to choose to kind of grow and deal with poverty first and clean up the environment later. And I think what we've seen over the past 10, 15 years is that's a false choice, that actually there is a much more healthy way to grow that is both more inclusive and that actually protects the environment in a more serious way. It's so interesting you bring that up. Uh, I, I just spoke to a, a diplomat who spent a considerable amount of time in China who said he was there and watched everybody on the bikes and then they moved to one car and then it was a two car family. And this is one of the things that you see with a, a middle class. And I think what you see in some of these countries that are starting to emerge is I want that too. Um, and, and you have people in these capitals, perhaps Brussels or London or Washington DC saying, no, 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 you shouldn't do that. It's gonna affect climate. Uh, and, and you know this argument. So talk to me about that and how do we remedy that? So that, that is a really, really good question because I, I think to some extent you have people living, living in this country, living in Europe saying, hey, wait a sec, if you continue to, if you in China or you in India buy cars the way we did, um, the planet will be wrecked, so don't do that. And I think that is a terrible argument to make. Um, there's very legitimate aspirations that people want. They want to be able to move from one place to another. They want to be able to have choices in terms of what they eat. But there is a better way. So one of the interesting things that China is doing is if you look at vehicles, how do you actually not use conventional vehicles that burn kind of petrol, but actually electric vehicles, right? that are powered by renewable energy on the grid? Or even more interestingly, how do you put in place public transit that provides even more efficient mobility services without requiring
people to buy cars. So we want to absolutely support um, those development aspirations of the middle class in these countries. But I think there's a better way to do it that is actually more sustainable, more inclusive. And that is, that is what the challenge is today. The coastal city of Shenzhen in southeastern China made headlines more than a decade ago when it launched an all-electric public bus fleet, which now includes some self-driving vehicles. The city also offers incentives for minimizing emissions in transport, such as favoring low-carbon methods of shipping goods into and out of its ports. The World Economic Forum calls Shenzhen China's innovation engine for sustainability. You mentioned Shenzhen. Uh, what inspires you about what's happening there? It's remarkable. You know, I, um, 1980s, you know, Shenzhen was a, a fairly quiet fishing village on the outskirts of Hong Kong. Now it's a city of 12 million people, China's Silicon Valley. Um, but it's also the city, the first city in the world where all the electric buses, I'm sorry, all the buses and taxis are now electric. It's a remarkably quiet, remarkably technologically advanced city. And that, that commitment to actually thinking about the future was not, was not easy, either politically or economically. Uh, finding how companies, government, uh, industry associations cooperate, finding how, um, how you actually uh, provide financial support to create that transition took time, took resources but it has created a model for what I think future cities are going to look like, which is a city that actually begins to ban all fuel combustion engines and move towards an electric fleet. China's emissions trading system, how is that going to work and can that be a model for other countries, do you think? So, so the emissions trading system in China is one way in which countries can more cost-effectively reduce carbon pollution. The way it's going to work in China are that the entities that will be regulated, and in the beginning that'll be those utilities that generate electricity, will be asked to actually meet a benchmark in terms of how much carbon pollution they can produce per unit of electricity generated. Some of these utilities will be able to perform better than that. Others might not be able to perform better than that. And so it creates a market where those that overachieve can sell, quote unquote, credits to those that underachieve. And the reason for designing this type of system is in order to make it a more efficient, a more market efficient, a more lower cost way in which to reduce carbon pollution. Um, what's good about this is that it is national in scope and China is targeting their power sector, which is the largest source of carbon emissions in the country. But what will be quite important is whether or not they set a severe, kind of a stringent enough standard that drives the reductions. Some of the experiences we've seen in the European Union, in California, other uh, regions that have put in place trading systems is often they don't put in place a stringent enough cap and so it doesn't drive the reductions we need to see. So that'll be a big question to look for over the coming months. And the other big question is how do we expand the emission trading system to go beyond power generation to other key sectors in the economy that also create a lot of the carbon emissions. Cutting emissions means overhauling China's energy mix. And researchers estimate that China's oil and gas consumption could add more than 200 million tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere in 2020. But China is working to position itself to reach peak emissions by its target of 2030. The country is now the world's largest producer, exporter, and installer of solar panels, wind turbines, batteries, and electric vehicles. Talk to me about that forward-thinking uh, mode that we do see emanating from Beijing. You know, you and I have been going to China quite a bit over the years, and we've actually seen a difference in the air quality over those years. Do you think it's more of a sense of urgency that's driving this? 
I, I think there's a few reasons that uh, China over the last 10 years has really, really grasped. I mean, it was quite interesting. I started with WRI, I started going to China about 12 years ago. And one couldn't talk and say to the government about climate change. It was a difficult conversation to have. We talked about it in terms of energy security. We talked about it in terms of efficiency. But climate change was considered to be a very divisive geopolitical issue. And now they come to us and say, you know, look at what we're doing on low carbon. Look at what we're doing on climate. Um, part of the reason, part of the reason is uh, in no small part, um, they see economic opportunity, right? Um, the solar, the wind, the companies that they've created, uh, the growth um, that that's generated is real. And it's going to grow even more in the future. The emphasis they've placed on electric vehicles, electric buses, hugely, hugely uh, impressive. So they've seen economic opportunity. The second is there's a lot of co-benefits associated with the low-carbon future. So if you shut down coal in your cities, if you actually restrict private car ownership, you actually do start to improve the quality of air in those cities, which is an important near-term public health benefit that has immediate support from people in those cities. And so there's these co-benefits that are quite significant as well. And at a time over the last few years where there's increasing international attention on this issue, people are looking at China to see, will China step up? Will it, will it lean in and do its share on climate? And so for these various reasons, kind of the economic, the kind of co-benefits related to health, the international reputational kind of political dividends it receives are in part what I think has driven this, this, this significant shift towards a low carbon future. But the question is, is China doing enough? And will it continue to pursue this path even when the economic headwinds get stronger as they are today? And so your answer to that would be? We don't know. Um, so, I mean, if you take something like uh, air quality, ideally what we'd like to see is a shift from private car ownership to public transit or to shift from coal to solar. But it's not going to be a sustainable solution if what we do is we take those coal plants and move them in other parts of China that are away from cities. That's not a long-term sustained solution. It may improve the air temporarily in the city, but in terms of what I believe, what I think increasingly the evidence shows is in China's economic self-interest, that may not be the smart thing to do. But the shift uh, in many of the directions that we're talking about, uh, don't they actually present to other countries what you were talking about earlier, that if you make this shift, there are benefits. Um, and, and this is the wave of the future. I mean, you, can, you have to turn the page at some point. You can cling to it as much as you want to, but we're going in a different direction. So, so I think in China, as in all countries around the world, there are different factions within government, within business. Um, some that see the opportunity in what a low carbon, more sustainable future looks like. Um, but there are others that uh, remain uh, wedded to 20th century development models, to 20th century industry, in part because that's where they benefit from. And I think part of what we need to be able to do uh, in China, but in countries around the world, is to think about what an inclusive, a fair transition is for those that might be in the coal industry, might be in oil and gas. We are talking about transitions. Overall, there are net gains, but that doesn't mean that certain sectors, certain individuals won't lose out. And that isn't necessarily fair. And so we need to think about how we design those types of transition plans so that there is benefits, that there are benefits for those individuals, for those sectors, and then they can become less politically opposed to the type of transition we need to see. The Paris Agreement for Climate Change open for signature. In 2015, the UN convened a climate meeting that aimed to accelerate what countries were doing to cut emissions. The deal, dubbed the Paris Agreement, vowed to keep global temperature rise this century to no more than two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Scientists say if the global temperature approaches this two degree threshold, we could see devastating effects to the planet, far worse than anything today. 
just spoke with somebody from the UN not too long ago who talked about poverty and that the goal the, the goal is to eliminate poverty. Yeah. Um, not reduce poverty by 50%. He said, if you make the goal, reduce it by 50%, that's as far as you go. And, and it gets into this whole concept of goals. You should have a goal that's really lofty rather than one that's easy to attain. Do you think that the goals out there when it comes to this issue are lofty enough? So it's, it's a, great, um, a great question. I, I think that when you think of something like the Paris Agreement, which was this extraordinary moment in 2015 when the world came together to agree on a deal for how to tackle the climate crisis, the long-term goal uh, of uh, well below two degrees, ideally 1.5 degrees, is a lofty goal. What they didn't do in Paris, though, was clarify precisely who would do what to achieve that goal. So it was a lofty goal, but the way in which they brought the world together is to say, everyone come together, tell us what you could do, and every five years, ratchet that up. So the problem that we have at the moment is even though we have a long-term target of two degrees, one and a half degrees, we're on a trajectory for three, three and a half degrees right now, which would be devastating. And so I think what we need to see is greater ambition from different countries to reduce emissions. And I kind of very much agree with you that sometimes those loftier goals unleash the creativity or innovation we need to see that kickstarts new industries, new jobs. Um, you know, just think about the speech from President John F. Kennedy in 1961 here in the United States when he said, I'd like to put a man on the moon before the end of the decade. No idea how to do it, right? But you think about what that unleashed in terms of a wide range of industries um, that are with us today. Uh, but it created a sense of excitement, enthusiasm, creativity that I think is, uh, is what we need to see now to tackle the climate. Crisis. You brought up Paris. Uh, President Xi at the time said that uh, the Paris Agreement was not a finishing line, but a starting point. Do you agree with him? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, very much. And, and so you start there. How do you get to the finish line? Because as you said, it's, it's, it's not easy. It, it, and and, and I, will, I will just take a moment to say that I think both President Obama and President Xi played an instrumental role in building political will for the Paris Agreement. So the meetings that they had in 2013, 2014, and the deal that they struck about what the United States would do, what China would do, really did generate uh, the right um, environment for other countries to come together to get that deal in Paris. But you're absolutely right. It was, it was the starting line. And so this point about every five years seeing much greater ambition is what we need to see. And just to, just to kind of put the scale of the challenge kind of in perspective, today we emit about 50 gigatons, which are billion tons of carbon dioxide a year. I'm going to do a little, a little visual, visual. Sometimes we gloss over numbers because we don't, you know, they just kind of don't resonate. But if we assume that every year in 2020, we emit 50 billion tons, and this is 50 billion tons, every 10 years, we have to actually cut our emissions by half. So by 2030, we need to go down to 25 billion tons of carbon. In 2040, we need to cut it in half again to 12 and a half billion tons. And by 2050, cut it in half again to a little over 6 billion tons. But we also then need to find ways to suck 6 billion tons of carbon out of the atmosphere, making this paper disappear by 2050. And so that gives you a sense of the scale. And the problem that we have at the moment is that when people are expected to step up in terms of ambition by 2020, what we've seen so far is we've seen 100 countries say, we are going to step up. We're going, to, we're going to actually increase the ambition of our climate targets. But collectively, those 100 countries represent only 15% of global emissions. So what that is saying is that all the large countries have not yet come to the table and are committed to step up. And that is what, why this year, 2020, is so important, is will these countries, will the Chinas, the United States, the Indias, the Japans, the Koreas of the world come in, step up, say we can do more. And that's what we need to achieve 
the dramatic reduction of emissions we need to see. I've never been more frightened by one white piece of paper in all my life. <laughs> I, does that but the impact you is, usually get? It, it is, but it's 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 not. It's like the man on the. It's exactly what we were talking about earlier. It is a bold target, so we should not shy away from it. I know you mentioned Kennedy and this inspirational, aspirational speech that he gave. Is there another one that kind of gets you up in the morning, that inspires you each day? Because this seems so insurmountable to people, and yet every day you're in the fight. For, for me, probably the most memorable speech in kind of American history was actually given by Martin Luther King, not, not that far from here. It's 1963, and I'm sure you recall when he, it's his I Have a Dream speech. Right? And you think about the moment. Um, blacks were being discriminated everywhere. Um, economically, things were not easy. Um, one could have been angry. One could have been despondent. He didn't start his speech, I have a nightmare, right? No one would have remembered it. He had a dream. And that, that, um, that optimism, that belief in a better future motivated you know, mobilized not only the country, but the world. And, and I think to some extent, that's the same challenge we see today. And when you think about his speech, the thought of a, a black president probably never even entered his mind, and it's happened in our lifetime. So it does kind of illustrate that even though things seem like they can't be attained, they can be. And that probably gives you, I guess, that, that extra oomph to get up each morning. Change, change happens much faster than most people realize. Um, coming back to this example of Shenzhen, a, a city that 20, 30 years ago no one in the world would have ever really heard of, is now a global leader in 30 years on, on the new technologies that we will see in all cities in the next 10 to 15 years. And the funny thing is, there's probably a Shenzhen out there right now that's percolating, that there's a, some inspirational mayor or governor or whatever saying, let's do this. There, there are these remarkable um, examples of disruptive new things happening that we, we, we don't, um, we, we may not fully appreciate, but they will scale, they will become uh, things that change the world. It is depressing when you look at the overall landscape uh, in terms of getting to this point. What motivates you, keeps you going, and, and how do you not get frustrated uh, as you continue to bang against the wall saying, you, you have to listen, this is serious? So, so I, I, I remain quite optimistic. Um, the challenges are, are real. The reductions are real uh, that we need to see. But the, but the actual, it, it is a better path. The low carbon, more sustainable path, more inclusive path is a better path. I think what we haven't done very well yet is actually um, provide the type of analytical work, the evidence with the right messengers to the right people. So part of the challenge is in the environmental community is speaking primarily with the environmental community, with environment ministers, with climate envoys, uh, with people that already necessarily feel the same way we do. So part of the challenge we have is how do you actually begin to tailor the messages, bring on board finance ministers, CEOs, and then how do you actually mobilize the public? But just to give you two kind of interesting data points that give me hope, um, and in the survey that they do every year about what are the biggest global risks facing the planet, and they ask a thousand CEOs all around the world what they think climate and the environment are by far the most significant, most immediate risks that these business leaders see. And then when you look at what's happening in many countries around the youth and the public mobilization, there is, there's a real kind of desire for change that I think will inspire political leaders to make a difference. So, so I think we are seeing that change. Uh, but the time is tight, and that's why the next few years are just uh, exceedingly important for us all to work hard for that better future. We'll leave it there. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.